Imagine a world without banks, without credit, without shopping. Imagine a time when virtually everyone believed that money could buy you not only material things, but also a place in heaven or hell. Between 1200 and 1350, in a small area of central Italy, the world changed forever. 800 years after the collapse of the Roman Empire, Europe's Dark Ages were coming to an end. New ideas and opportunities were taking life in new directions. Cities, commerce, the visual arts, religion and our understanding of ourselves would never be the same. This was the dawn of the Renaissance, the first light of the modern Western world. A new power was emerging. There were new heroes. Not knights, nobles, or emperors, but bankers and businessmen. Their power was money. They could read and write, and documents were their weapon of choice. Contracts, assessments, receipts, reports, land transactions, tax records, thousands upon thousands of pages detailing private fortunes and civic revenues and expenditures unimaginable a century before. This is the State Archives of Siena a treasure trove of more than 200,000 folios, registers, and individual documents dating from the 1100s. Here a picture emerges of a world increasingly focused on money and financial transactions. Questo materiale, tra questo materiale vi segnalo la Bicherna, che era la magistratura finanziaria del comune. Among all these materials, I would like to bring your attention to the Bicherna, the judicial authority that oversaw financial matters. In these registers, called Bicherne, are found the taxes paid by the citizens and also expenses from the smallest to the largest. Expenses for the purchase of weapons when there was a war, expenses for the purchase of grain for the citizens, and expenses to build the walls around the city or to construct public buildings. Also, expenses to pay the artists who were beautifying the city itself with their artistic creations. Among the revenues are listed the taxes paid by the citizens, but also very minor things, like fines. For example, there is a fine paid by the poet Cecco Angiolieri because his maid Nuccia was wearing a dress not appropriate for a woman of her low status. Therefore, the poet, who perhaps had a special relationship with Nuccia, paid the fine from his own pocket. These Bicerna volumes are among the Siena archive's greatest treasures. In a city that took such pride in the talents of its painters, commissions for artists extended even to the covers of tax records. These painted covers provide glimpses of the growing importance of money and of the aspirations of the city, of taxes, fines and tithes being collected and spent for the greater glory of Siena. The Bicerne are still yielding new discoveries. 
They are a paper trail into the minute details of daily life more than 700 years ago. Like this intriguing piece of information about one of the most famous painters of the 13th century. For example, these two, Francesco and Bindo. They used to own a house together in the neighborhood of San Quirico close to Stalloregge. What could be interesting in this is that the description locates their house next to Duccio, the painter. Oh, look what I spotted. Look what I found. I wasn't expecting that. Prior to the beginning of the 13th century, such extensive documentation would have been unimaginable. Up to that point, virtually anything written was on parchment or vellum, very costly materials made of the finely tanned skin of sheep or goats. The development of a much less expensive alternative made it practical to keep the records necessary for business. Paper was being manufactured in Italy in the 1100s. By the 1200s, it was becoming indispensable. More reading and more writing led inevitably to eye strain, and another 13th century innovation became increasingly necessary. Eyeglasses were being manufactured in Pisa by 1280, and by 1300 they were a significant part of the glass industry in Venice. Glass in Venice, saffron in San Gimignano, textiles in Florence and Siena. Industry, trade and finance were flourishing. Merchants sold fine Italian goods in Europe and traveled as far as North Africa, the Near East, and eventually China to bring the riches of the world to sell back home. In the 13th and 14th centuries, they built a system of trade and finance that brought a flood of wealth into Italy. Since the collapse of the Roman Empire in the 4th and 5th centuries, international trade had virtually ceased. Roman armies no longer maintained roads or ensured a degree of safety for travelers. Goods and services were bartered without money changing hands. Trade, such as it was, was mainly within local communities. In 1095, Pope Innocent III launched the first crusade to battle the Muslim rulers of Jerusalem to win the Holy Land for Christendom. Over the next two centuries, successive crusades financed by the church tried in vain to achieve this goal. An indirect benefit was that roads that had fallen into ruin for 600 years were repaired so that crusaders from Italy, France and Germany could reach the east. The improvements the Crusades brought to roads and the new growth of cities with laws and the power to enforce them made it possible to travel further and more safely. The times were right for trade to expand within Italy and beyond. The business of doing business was also made easier with a new numeral system that came to replace Roman numerals with Arabic numerals and zero. A young Pisan named Fibonacci learned the new system in North Africa. In 1202, he wrote the Liber Abaci, the Book of the Abacus, or Book of Calculating. When my father, who had been appointed by his country as public notary in the customs at Bugia acting for the Pisan merchants going there, was in charge, he summoned me to him while I was a child, and having an eye to usefulness and future convenience, desired me to stay there and receive instruction in the school of accounting. There, when I had been introduced to the art of the Indians' nine symbols through remarkable teaching, knowledge of the art very soon pleased me above all else, and I came to understand it.
This more efficient way to record transactions had been developed by the great Arab mathematician Al-Khwarizmi in the 9th century. Fibonacci's talent was to describe the system practically with examples from commerce, specifically for merchants. It led directly to the ledgers and accounting we use in business today. Wholesale, retail, commodities, and even futures were all part of the 13th and 14th century merchant's world. Some traders, like those of San Gimignano, had a local crop to sell. The town produced some of the best saffron available anywhere. This spice, still the most expensive in the world, is laboriously harvested from the stigmas of crocuses. Its value rivaled gold, and it brought wealth to San Gimignano and its merchants. Other businesses began in the east. Fibonacci's father was involved in a Pisan venture that traded in wax from Bougia in North Africa. In a time without electricity, candles were a major commodity. Bougia produced the best quality beeswax for the most costly candles, which is why the French word for candle is still bougie. Around 1200, there were more than 3,000 Western merchants in Egypt, most of them Italian. In the early 14th century, there were Italian merchants in India and China. All of them faced a daunting challenge. Getting their money into and out of Italy. Without automated banking machines, without banks, without paper money, moving funds from one place to another was a significant problem. The only way was to physically transport coin. And this was dangerous. Within their walls, cities generally maintained order. Keeping territories outside the wall safe for travelers was not always possible. On remote roads, there were dangers for merchants and messengers carrying goods and gold. Today, the castles that dot the peaceful Tuscan landscape have a fairy tale quality. This belies their violent and politically tumultuous origins. This tower, the Rocca of Ignoni, was a military fortress. In the 13th and 14th centuries, disputes between noble families and rivalries between the city governments of Siena and Florence often erupted in military battles. From this high vantage point, the Salimbeni family, which was frequently at odds with the city of Siena, could see the approach of attackers from rival families or the Sienese army and control the roads. For merchants and travelers, routes like this were unpredictably dangerous. Anyone carrying cash or goods would have felt great relief on arriving here. This is the Spedaletto built in the 12th century as a safe resting place for travelers and pilgrims. It was administered by a charitable organization, the Spedale, or Hospital, of Santa Maria della Scala in Siena, which also used it as a storehouse for grain. It is one of several similar stops along the Via Francigena, the busiest trade route in Tuscany. The impetus to solve the worldly problem of moving cash from one place to another 
came from the church. Just as the Crusades led to road improvements, they were also a catalyst for revolutionary new developments in finance that would lead to banking and the economics of international big business as we know it today. When we're talking about this kind of economy, what we're looking at is what makes economy an international economy. How do we move money over long distances? There's always a local economy. Somebody needs to buy uh, bread, somebody needs to buy meat, somebody needs to build a house, and so we have an exchange locally, and that can be done by barter. But if we're talking about an economy understood in broader terms with international movements of money, we have to have uh, uh, an agency that's demanding that movement, and then we have to have people who are willing to facilitate it. And the agency that really makes that possible or requires that is precisely the papacy. Because by the time we get through the, you know, through the Middle Ages into the, uh, you know, into the 11th century, 10th century, 8th and 9th, I mean, going right back, one of the few international bodies functioning in Europe at that time is precisely the papacy. It has its center in Rome. It has branches all through Europe not only the papacy as an institution itself, but also the religious houses, the, the, the great monasteries, and later on the great, uh, the great uh, friaries, the Dominicans and the Franciscans. And what happens in cases like this is that now you have something that we can understand almost as an international body, a headquarters and branches out in different parts of Europe. How do we transfer things from one to the other? The church was a superpower and a multinational business. It was the government in many places. It collected taxes and maintained armies. Its bureaucracy was the largest and best organized in Europe. One of the things that every Christian is required to do is pay a tithe, pay 10% a, pay of what they earn to the support of the church. Some of that stays locally, some of that is supposed to go to Rome. Beyond that, at the, at the higher level, say the level of, of bishops, uh, the level of higher church officials, they would also owe taxes that they would owe to Rome. There would be taxes that they would have to pay. Monks and friars trained as clerks kept meticulous records of every fee, every tax owed and collected. But more was needed, and there was the problem of how to send money to where it was needed most. The popes had employed the Knights Templar, a secretive religious order of noble crusaders, to help move money to the church's armies in the Holy Land. A system of written assurances, much like checks today, allowed money to be transferred between the strongholds of the order from country to country. But the Templars were not always in favor. The order was dissolved in 1312, and many of the knights were accused of heresy and put to death. The church needed more money from more sources, men rich enough to make loans until tithes and taxes could be collected to pay them back. And they needed to ensure that money collected from all over Europe actually reached Rome. We have then an international body. We have the need to move money from one place to another. And we have roads that are extremely dangerous. One of the ways you could do this is simply take a bag of money and move it from England to Rome. Uh, but you're, you're bound to be mugged three or four times along the way, so your, your bag of money will be gone before you get there. What you need is a safer form of transferring money, and the church is the institution that needs to transfer money in largest quantities earliest on. So banking develops as a way to allow the church, among other institutions, to transfer money from one part of Europe to another. And out of this, we get the development of things like bills of exchange where uh, the bill of exchange is a, essentially a, a, a paper transfer, but it allows money to be transferred from, say, Rome to London or from Paris back to Rome, essentially working through agents, through banks, who do the paperwork, who establish the transfer itself, but then are doing it on behalf of the institution of the church. So certainly at that early stage, it's the bankers who develop the instruments, but they're working as the agents of the church. 
In the 1230s, the papacy turned to the Bonsignori family and their partners, the most prominent merchants of Siena, to act as their banking agents in Europe. The growth of this firm was almost beyond imagination. In 20 years, they had agencies all the way from London to the Mideast. In a short time, similar firms such as the Ptolemy and the super companies of the Bardi and the Peruzzi were making fortunes from conglomerated businesses that involved manufacturing, commodities such as grain and raw wool, international trade, and lending money. To avoid the risk of transporting coin across Europe, the large firms developed the Bill of Exchange, a written agreement that an agent of the company in one location would pay out an amount guaranteed by another agent in another location. This meant that the banker could provide the Pope in Rome with money equivalent to the value of funds held in another country. In this way, funds could be made available wherever there were agents of the company to guarantee the transaction, without the necessity of physically transporting gold. This is the beginning of credit as we know it today. Bills of exchange relied on another 13th century innovation, the establishment of internationally recognized currencies and rates of exchange. It's very important even nowadays that commodities be traded internationally in only a few currencies. And one of the things we have in the modern economy is the importance of the American dollar, but then also in the, the growing importance of the euro. The late medieval economy was no different. You had to have currencies which were solid, which were reliable, that had a value which people across Europe could, could depend on. And a city which could develop that kind of currency could end up having their currency become an international standard of exchange. Florence did this already from 1252 when it started minting the florin. There were other cities around this time, international trading cities. Venice had the ducat, Genoa had the Genovese. They all come up around the same time. The florin was not used in Florentine local commerce. It was only used in Florence's international commerce. All of these coins, the florin in particular, had about 3.5 grams of gold in them. If you were a trader in Paris and you got a florin, you knew that it had 3.5 grams of gold. If you were a trader in Lyon, in London, in Seville, you knew this. And this is what traders depended on. So the Florentine bankers could use the florin, Florentine traders could use the florin, and they knew it would be accepted worldwide. The growth of the Tuscan banking firms such as the Bonsignori and the Ptolemy, the Bardi and the Peruzzi was, however, based on usury, the illegal and immoral practice of charging interest on money loaned. As depicted in a harrowing image of hell in the Collegiata Church in San Gimignano, the sin of usury was among the greatest and most repellent evils in the medieval world. The word usury comes into most modern languages directly from the Latin word for use, usum, ad usum, at the use of someone. And usury really is the extortion of interest uh, for money, which is put at the use of the borrower for a given period of time. Medieval theologians said that gold and silver, unlike animals, do not reproduce naturally and therefore, even economically speaking, they should not be brought into a system that produces profit. That very purest notion, however, could not be sustained in the wealthy industrial and banking city-states of central Italy in the 13th and 14th centuries. The wealth of the merchants, the wealth of the cities, the capacity of the wealthy merchants in the cities to look after the needs of the poor 
the capacity of these cities to erect splendid churches to the honor of God and for the delectation of the citizenry. All of that depended on the production of money. The lending of money, even outside of the limits of the national state, of the city-state, Florentine bankers loaned to the English or the French in the 14th century. The lending of money for interest was an evil that everyone more or less accepted. Theologians, really by the 13th and 14th century, began to look for ways to find a benefit, to find a positive value, to justify the charging of interest for money. And uh, they did succeed uh, up to a point, certainly by the 14th and 15th century, a whole school of thought had developed which made it acceptable to lend money within certain limits for interest. And yet there was an enduring sense of guilt in those who made great amounts of money and who multiplied it by lending, by charging interest. What today we would consider normal and absolutely legitimate business practices still produced a sense of unease in 14th and 15th century Italian merchants. And so one of the responses to their fear that they had sinned by usury, a response encouraged by the church because the church really had to help these people find an inner balance. One of the uh, expedients was to invite the usurious uh, rich merchant or banker to contribute part of his wealth for the maintenance of a religious community, for the building and embellishment of a church, many of the superb works of art in churches, the beautiful silver reliquaries, silver and gold. Here's a famous one in the Florence Cathedral. Much of this was in the earlier periods paid for as a kind of expiation money. And we know that uh, bankers especially looked upon the need to use their gains, to use their profits for the church and for poor as an extremely important part of what they did. The moral responsibilities and the temptations that came with money were serious. More and more people were becoming wealthy, and the question of how to spend your money affected more people in society than ever before. From the first time since antiquity, gold was increasingly in the hands of those who were enterprising. Gold was the world's most precious metal, the stuff of myth and legend. What for centuries had been solely in the hands of princes and popes became available to a new social class. Intelligence, courage, and ability could bring you gold. You could earn it. And there were more tempting goods than ever before on which to spend it. For the wealthy, life in 14th century Tuscany was more comfortable than it had been half a century earlier. International trade brought luxury to Florence and Siena, and both cities still retain their appreciation of the best most costly and beautiful consumer goods. Then, as now, citizens were tempted by oriental silks, spices, gold, precious gems, glass, fine cotton, and a variety of exotic foods. Not everyone, however, believed that life was changing for the better. Some lamented the loss of the good old days and deplored the greed and luxury of modern times. Giovanni Villani, a well-to-do Florentine merchant and a shareholder in the Peruzzi firm, one of the two Italian super companies of the 14th century, wrote a vivid chronicle of Florentine life. Of a time just before he was born in 1277, Villani says, The citizens of Florence lived soberly and on simple food, spending little, and their manners were often coarse and plain. They dressed themselves and their wives in coarse garments. Florentine women wore boots without ornament, and the greatest of them settled for a single tight-fitting gown of coarse scarlet cloth fastened with a leather belt in the ancient fashion. The common women wore coarse green cloth of cambrai cut in the same style. Such were the plain manners of the Florentines, but they were faithful and true to their commune, and with their simple life and poverty, 
they did greater and more virtuous things than are done in our time of increased delicacy and luxury. During the 13th and 14th century, clothes became more luxurious and domestic architecture improved significantly. As a result of the economic boom in the 13th and 14th centuries, people could afford to build larger and more luxurious homes. One of the most significant improvements in domestic architecture during this period was the introduction of the fireplace. Previously, cooking and heating fires on the interiors of houses